Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga Professionals episode. My name is Adam, and today I'm being joined by New York Times best-selling author Margaret Weiss. How are you today? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm <laughs> very well. I'm very excited to speak with you. I'm so excited about <laughs> Dragonlance being back. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I was, I was speaking to Michael Williams uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, and I just thought it was really funny. Um, we had this sort of wonderful just back and forth, and one of the first things I asked him before we went on air was, do you ever get tired of talking about Dragonlance? So I'm wondering, do you ever get tired of talking about Dragonlance? <laughs> no, I don't. I always find something new to think about or talk about when I do. So. <laughs> That's great. Um I mean, certainly because, you know, you, you are a, a wildly successful author within that realm. Uh, you, you, you have to kind of love it a little bit, right? <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so did Michael tell you that he wrote some poems for the new book? Yes. Yes, he did. And it was it's really funny because we had this really great back and forth about um, how how much do you know about what you are writing for? <laughs> you know, like, so how much of the uh -huh. story does he know about in order to write the poem for it? And, you know, he gave us, uh, you know, a little bit of information about, you know, he, he had some brief ideas and stuff, you know, sort of abstract generic stuff. But um, is that challenging for you when you, when you reach out to uh, someone like Michael Williams uh, to, to come up with a poem without knowing all of the details? Oh no, Michael and I have known each other for so many years. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, and a lot, a lot of times he would be writing the poem and I would be, and Tracy and I would be in the midst of writing the book. So in some cases he knew as much about it as we did. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes out in the wash then. That's great. Yes, it does. <laughs> That's funny. Um, can I ask you really quick? Because it only like cropped up in my radar very, very recently, but the classic designation for Dragonlance, what is that all about? Um, well, Wizards of the Coast, I mean, we, we got the license from them, mm -hmm. you know, and Penguin Random House, uh, Del Rey is our publisher. Uh, Wizards of the Coast is going to be doing, as I, the last I heard, um, and I'm, you know, sort of not in the loop on all this, but the last I heard, they're going to be doing a Dragonlance 5e version. Right. And making some changes and our classic version, because they didn't have this all figured out yet what they wanted to do, so they decided that, you know, we could pretty much rely on the old Dragonlance and call it classic so that whatever they wanted to do would be new Dragonlance. Oh wow! Okay, so <laughs> how does that make you feel as as one of the founders of this world to to not have to? And I don't know if you ever really had total control over it because obviously the IP owners are TSR and then Wizards. But do you ever feel like it's sort of slipping through your fingers a little bit? Oh no! I mean that happened years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean there were over a hundred Dragonlance books published. Yeah. You know, at one time or over the years, and you know, those authors. I mean, there was no way we could be in touch with them and follow what they wanted to do. And you know, in a way, it was kind of cool because Dragonlance became everybody's vision. Right. How you envision Dragonlance might be totally different from how I did, but that doesn't make it wrong. Right. It just makes it different, because and and it's a huge world, and it was kind of cool, you know. I w I edited with Pat McGilligan a lot of the short stories, mm -hmm. and it was really really neat to see the different take authors had on Dragonlance. So, you know, that was that was never a problem for me. I think it's a really interesting idea, um, sort of exemplified through the the editing and and obviously other authors contributing to the world, but. You know, from the the fan side of it, it's evident whenever you speak to any fan of the the, the saga. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that Dragonlance does mean something very dramatically different. You know, we all bring our own hangups and life experiences and stuff to everything that we do and consume. And so, why would this be any different? What I mean, if if you could sort of encapsulate it, what does Dragonlance mean to you? Oh, um, 
I always say that Dragonlance was uh, was a story about a group of friends uh, uh, who, a group of ordinary people. They weren't princes or kings or, you know, they were middle class working folk. Yeah. And they were put into an extraordinary circumstance. <laughs> and how they handled it and maintain their friendship or didn't maintain their friendship, you know, was, that was the story. That's interesting because when we do sort of start to extrapolate the character development and see where the characters end up, there are a few that really do stand out as being much more than working class. I mean, you know, Rachel Majir being probably the, the top of that list, you know, challenging the gods and stuff at one point. So, um, do you feel, uh, do you ever feel a, a sort of um, concern about having any individual characters overstep the bounds of the frame that you're trying to tell the story in? Well, no, I knew Rayce's story from the beginning. I mean, he was always my character. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy always said that, um, that he was Tannis and he wanted to be Sturm, but he came across more as Fizban. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so in, in writing the story, Raceland was my character and Raceland started out as, um, uh, you know, a, yeah. a, a, uh, he and his twin brother grew up under difficult circumstances. Yeah. Their mother went crazy. Their father died. Kitty Ara pretty much raised them mm -hmm. and taught them, you know, how to get on in life. And then she left and abandoned them. And so they had to work for a living, as yeah. did Flint and, well, Taz, you never know, but... Uh, <laughs> work, question mark? They, they all did. Yeah. And, uh, and when they came together that night in the inn, it was, you know, it was just kind of, well, you could say the gods were at work, or it was happenstance that they ran into Gold Moon and River End, and mm -hmm. there you go. Yeah. Um, is it easy to slip back into the Dragonlance mode of writing? Because, you know, you, you have written a number of series with a number, uh, you know, by yourself and also with other contributors. I mean, you, you have, um, a healthy, uh, body of work underneath you. Is it, is it tough to get back into the Dragonlance mode? Yeah, it was. Um, and especially since so, there's been so much written. Uh, but I had a really, Tracy and I had a really great, a stimist, we call him, Shivam Bhatt. Um, Shivam uh, agreed to work with me. And whenever I had a question about anything Dragonlance related, because at this point, Shivam knows a heck of a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> um, I would ask him, you know, I'd send him emails sometimes, I don't know how many a day, poor guy. And... Uh, and he would do the research, look up all the, you know, references and everything else. Because I used, um, as reference point, I used the, the original 12 modules, adventure gaming modules. Mm -hmm. And all of the Dragonlance books that Tracy and I had written. And um, also referenced books that Doug Niles had written about the Dwarven Kingdom right. and, um, you know, various other sources. And, and like I say, Shivan was a tremendous help on all that. That's great. Yeah, I would imagine it would be seemingly insurmountable to remember every element oh, yeah. <laughs> of everything in Dragonlance. There's just <laughs> so much to go into. And, and then also, do you ever find yourself... Um, maybe a little bit frustrated when there is conflicting information, you know, because depending on the author and when they wrote it, things changed. Yeah. And, uh, and in that case, I went back to the original source as okay. much as I could. Nice. What uh, you, you've collaborated with Tracy Higman for, for years and years on, on multiple different, um, IPs. Um, what was it like after, you know, having a, a break from collaborating with him to go back and, and, you know, revisit Dragonlance together? Oh, well, we've always been friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've kept in touch. And um, 
you know, when we had this idea that we'd like to do this, uh, we worked on the plot together first. So that gets us kind of into the rhythm of working together again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and it was fun. I always enjoy it. So there's been, um, you know, I don't know if it's leaks or just information about the hiccups with creating this, uh, new trilogy. And, um, Tracy had said that the, the first novel is completed and submitted and the second clearly is coming out in August 9th next year or this year now. Um, and the second one is, is that finished already? Yes. The second is finished. Um, it's with the publisher right now. Um, we've gone through initial edits. And, of course, we work with Watsi on the edits, mm -hmm. um, you know, to make sure we're all on the same page. And uh, so at the moment, we're working on the third one. That's great. Now, that is that is at the heart of what I wanted to ask you about. Um, and I don't know how much you're at will to speak to it, but can you talk about the changes that are proposed or, or sort of uh, forced on uh, you two as authors from you know, the IP holders, uh, uh, does it change your story at all? Oh, no, they've been, I mean, our editor, Ann Grill, has been terrific to work with. She actually read uh, the Dragonlance novels before we started working, and they didn't, you know, they really didn't tell us to do anything. They, you know, other than an editor mm -hmm. working with authors, <laughs> and having been an editor myself, I know, an editor suggests, you know, maybe this isn't quite the way you want to say this, or maybe you want to change this a little. But no, they've been absolutely great to work with, and this is our story. And um, yeah, we're telling it the way we want to. Yeah, so I guess that classics is a way of, of, of again, just solidifying, no, this is your vision. And right. isolated all wholly un unto itself. Interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, are you ever concerned about uh, the MacGuffins, re revisiting old, older MacGuffins and, or plot tropes like the device of time journeying? Um, you know, it was, it was heavily featured in Legends. It was uh, integral to War of Souls. And um, now it's going to be added into this new trilogy. Do you, do you feel like it's, you guys are using it in a new way? Or like, how, how does that feel uh, revisiting it? Oh, yeah. We're using, definitely using it in a new and different way. Okay. So it is, you know, the the synopsis of the book released is saying that she has to collect it from Tasselhoff Burfoot. And so clearly we're going back in time to when Tasselhoff had it. So the, is, is there a way for you to sort of nail down the, the time reference? Is this, is this post-Legends before Fifth Age? Or is this between, I don't know, like where would you put this in timeline? Well, not necessarily. This okay. has happened. Oh, okay. Well, that definitely changes <laughs> everything. <laughs> I mean, it, this is set. So this is a more modern timeline. Mm -hmm. um, Raceland is dead. The Kitiara has attacked Palantis. Um, oh, so this is post. Germ is then. dead. Yeah, so it's post War of the Land. Okay. But clearly, it's not breaking into the fifth age as of yet. Mm, no. Okay. <laughs> the, the stuttering. Mm. <laughs> I had my heart racing a little bit. Um, no, no, no. This is me trying to imagine the timeline. So, right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, when uh, when you find yourself uh, sort of revisiting these older characters, like Tasselhoff Burfitt, for example. Um, do you ever feel like you have to sort of tiptoe around the character or, or, or bring in other characters to help f fill out um, the experience? Because again, you know, most of us have experienced with these characters as in relation to the other characters, you know, Tasselhoff and Flint, just for example. Um, do you feel like you had to bring in a lot of the classic Dragonlance heroes in order to ground the story at all? Or, or do you really feel comfortable bring a whole new set of heroes and just letting them go? No, this is a whole new... I mean, Tasselhoff is Tasselhoff in his age. Yeah. You know, he's not going to change. And uh, so it was, except his circumstance. And so, no, it was, it was always really fun. Um, you know, some of the old characters do come back, the ones that are still alive. Mm -hmm. 
uh, such as Tika and Karaman, um, which is nice that they come back because their relationship with Tasselhoff. So they give us a nice grounding there. And it was fun one to get to meet them mm-hmm. and their reaction to her. And uh, so, so that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so. Just out of pure curiosity, um, I appreciate it when you have a, a story that has seemingly constant chaos all around in the world, but there is still an a relationship that's able to be somewhat stable. You know, I mean, Tika and Karaman definitely had their issues in Legends, but after that, they seem to just have been 100% devoted to each other, just pure happiness. And of, clearly every relationship in the real world takes work and effort. But am I reading too much into this? Um, is there a reason why you put a really solid relationship into this story when it's constantly surrounded by change and chaos? Well, yeah, it was. And, and again, because Tika and Carmen have, you know, touched so many lives mm. of the other characters. I mean, you know, like I say, Raceland is dead. Carmen is still trying to get over that. Yeah. Uh, mm. And Tika never really liked him. And uh, <laughs> so we're kind of doing Tasselhoff into the mix and and he's in the end of the last home and walking off with the spoons and, you know. <laughs> and uh, then we toss our heroine into the mix of this and uh, what she's dealing with. And, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it's, it's a really nice point to be able to bring everything together. What do you think that this new trilogy is going to bring to Dragonlance? Because when I when I think in reflection of, of all the different trilogies and sextets and collections that have been written, it seems like all of them bring something new in some way. Um, is this going to follow that trend, this new trilogy? Yes. Is there I any... can't tell you. Okay, I was going to say, is there any way to <laughs> get into that anymore? I'm trying to dig for information here. <laughs> No, I, I really. The so one thing, one thing I can tell you, hmm. and I haven't told it, told this to anybody. So I'm telling you, you're making news. Ooh. The original title of the first book was going to be Castlehoff's Wife. Whoa! Wow! Okay, that's awesome. Can I? That that one of the um, subscribers to this channel had asked this as one of the questions. Where do the titles come from? Do you have control? Like, what made you change the title from that to Dragons of Deceit? Uh, they the publisher wanted it because it fit in with the rest, like Dragons of Autumn right. Twilight, Dragons of this, Dragons of that, and so they. Was there I ever... mean, in a way, the other was more of a working title. Yeah. Because lots of books have working titles since. Many times the official title doesn't get decided on until the very end of the book after it's already written. Right. So that was more of a working title. Okay. Wow, that just brings up so many possibilities in my mind. That's amazing. Um, when you uh, when you write these stories, are you writing for yourself? Are you writing for the fans? Uh, where do you land on that? You know, Tracy says that, and he said way back in the day, that Kryn was a real world, and we all of us live in it. And that, and what he meant was that even after all these years, he and I could go back there, kind of like you go back to Disney World, and mm-hmm. you say, oh, wow, I remember this, and that was how Tracy and I were. And that's how I think the fans are, that we go back to a place that is familiar, that we know the end of the last home, we know Palancis, um, we've walked these streets, we know the Great Library, we know Astinas, um, and we walk these familiar places with new characters. Yeah, that's great. It is... It's wonderful because I don't, when you were first writing um, the original Chronicles back in the day, um, do you remember if there was a specific age group that you were writing to? No, we were, I mean, well, there was because 
the Dragonlance novels were the first adult novels that TSR had ever done. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had done and had huge success with the Rose Estes books, the um, Choose Your Own Adventure kind. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but Dragonlance, Gene Black, our editor, uh, wanted to do, propose to management that they do a series of adult novels uh, that would be a you know aimed at say teenage adult that that sort of mm-hmm. age range, and um, I was actually hired to edit those novels. And Tracy had proposed the Dragonlance uh, games, um, and and which were the first games to ever have an, an entire plot that he and his wife Laura had come up with, and so. Um, Gene said, well, let's base this on Dragonlance. And I was hired to edit those novels and to come up with the storyline based on the plot that extended over 12 gaming, you know, adventure modules. And so, um, and that's how I met Tracy. And that's where we started. We, we got so involved in the story that we decided we should be the one to write the novel. You know? <laughs> yeah. Never mind hiring some other outside writer who didn't get it. We got it. Right. right. And so that's what happened. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I originally asked the question because um, it is something that, you know, I was exposed to initially in middle school. And that's where I fell in love with the world. But even now, as a grown man in my you know mid late forties, I'm returning to the world to to just get inspired again and and just have this mm-hmm. you know wonderful nostalgia and to have it still going after so long. Are you ever surprised that it has the legs that it does? Oh yeah, I mean <laughs> we were we felt we were just lucky to get the first book published. I mean we were doing this while TSR was teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Yeah. And so at this point and in fact that's why the book the first book ends with the wedding of Goldman and Riverwind because our editor wasn't even sure there was going to be a second book. <laughs> so let's have a happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um are you ever concerned with the reception of the novels when you write them um or after they've been published? Oh, every writer is concerned Mm -hmm. about how, you know, people view their novels. Uh, I mean, it's like sending your child out into the world. You don't want to get beat up, (laughs) (laughs) you know, Um, but you kind of, who was it that said that they take, because you get all kinds of criticism, especially you know, literary criticism, like from Publishers Weekly or, you know, right. something like that. And um, you you take what teaches you something. And if you learn from it, then it's good. If it's just, you know, brutalizing you or just beating up on you because they can, uh, then you just ignore it. Right. I always remember the funniest criticism we had with Dragonlance came from a British critic who said they were too American and <laughs> fantasy, fantasy should be British. <laughs> okay. And I always love that. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to process what that means. I know. We were a little confused, but, <laughs> but we, we thought that was funny. <laughs> All right. I mean, it all stems from Tolkien, I suppose. So maybe that's what, you know, what he's yes, getting at. Yes, I think, yeah, I think that's what, where they were coming from. Oh, is it true that Tolkien is the only fantasy you read or have read? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I have to hear my own voice in my head. Right. And, um, and I started writing, I mean, I started writing fantasy years ago, um, although... Really, I my first novels were science fantasy, the Star of the Guardians book, right. that were later published after Dragonlance. But um, but yeah, I needed I needed to hear my own voice in my head. I didn't need to re you know hear Tolkien or anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and I I don't know. It's sort of like uh, you know a plumber at his house has leaky pipes. <laughs> like you you work <laughs> you work in fantasy and you craft your own worlds. Do you really want to be revisiting other people? And <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. 
Exactly. And, and too often I found uh, when I was an editor that so many authors are just read, you know, they'll say, well, I don't read anything else except fantasy. And I'm like, you've never read Charles Dickens or Jane Austen or right. you need a good literary grounding before you write anything. Yeah. Yeah. What was your most challenging novel to write? Oh, probably the Star of the Guardian. Oh yeah, is it the, because it was the, the first ones? The or? books. Yeah, they were the first ones, and um, I had a. It it took me about six months to really figure out where I wanted to go with the plot, mm. and you know, and that's just working on the plot. That wasn't even starting writing, and. Then once I once I had that and it was kind of a revelation, you know, it comes as as a sort of epiphany. Once I had that, I was I was able to work on them, and you know, then of course I'd send them out and they get rejected. And um, but through those, uh, a New York editor actually sent me a personalized letter telling me why she rejected it not a form letter and she actually encouraged me to keep writing. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, that was that was just so amazing. Yeah, I think I think one of the hardest things to do as a as an artist, I think in any form is to take constructive criticism, but I think it's the most important lesson that anyone can learn. Oh, yeah, you have to. And when when someone can actually pay that off with saying, you know, look, no, we really appreciate what you're doing. You're just not quite there yet. Keep it up. Right. That's great. That's right. really great. Yeah. It needs to and be I've worked with authors. I worked with authors who refused to take editorial, you know, comment, and they don't last long. Wow. Yeah. Because uh, you know, you need authors tend to get so mired and, and wandering around in the trees and everything else that they don't see the forest. Mm -hmm. The editor sees the forest and can narrow in on the trees. And so, like I say, having been an editor myself, I so appreciate editorial critique. And sometimes I don't agree with it. Sometimes I can get really angry. Yeah. And, but then I calm down. And, and my editor's you know, I've been really good. If I say, no, I am adamant. This is the way this scene needs to be written. They're always, okay, we trust you. We'll go with it. Oh, that's great. Um, can I, can I ask you a, maybe, you know, a little candid question? What did you think about, um, Dragons of Summer Flame process? Cause I, I that was supposed to be a trilogy, right? And then they sort of, yeah, again, TSR was going bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was the, the just, the cause of it. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. What would you have included yeah, if you had the opportunity to, um, you know, spread it out into a trilogy? No, I don't think I'd go back. Yeah. Okay. No, I actually what it was supposed to be, it was supposed to go on and be the search for magic because the world lost magic. And right. then there was finding magic. And, but then, you know, watch you bought TSR and there was a whole, you know, and so it was just like, nope, sorry. Wow. I didn't realize that, that you guys were going to be doing the, the, the loss of magic. And then also in that same trilogy, recovering it. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about the direction the fifth age took after, <laughs> after they, they bought a, uh, watch you bought TSR? Well, that was a, Huge controversy. Uh, so we just pretty much walked away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you did come they back. Didn't, yeah, we did, came, we did come back. Um, Peter Atkinson brought us back. Uh, my daughter actually was working for TSR at the time. Oh, wow. And um, Peter Atkinson, at one point, he had all the employees gathered together for a meeting. And they were he was explaining Monty's vision and what they were going to do and everything else. And at one point, and he said, and who was it who blew up Dragonland in some flame? <laughs> and my daughter raised her hand and said, that would be my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter called me the next day. And I'm like, oh, my God, P 
Peter Atkinson is calling me. <laughs> and he said, I just wanted to apologize. And I hadn't heard. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, thank you, Peter. But what are you apologizing for? <laughs> and then he told me. And then, then my daughter told me. And it was, it was funny. Oh, that's great. Was there any trepidation returning at that point to sort of re-steer the well, ship? Well, no, because we adored Tracy and I. After we met Peter, we adored him. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to help. We, we wanted to help make things as, you know, we wanted to help them bring Dragonlance back if that's what they wanted to do. Okay, yeah. fine. We'll help. That's great. Um, did you know the direction that Mina was going to take? in Dark Disciple Trilogy when you were writing War of Souls? Yes. I actually wanted her to be a dark Joan of Arc, and I actually researched Joan of Arc um, to, to um, study her character. Fascinating. Um, yeah, she really was. I read Mark Twain's book on her, and uh, it, it's really, a lot of people don't know Mark Twain wrote a book about Joan of Arc, but he did, and wow. it, it was really interesting. So. Yeah, I think um, the the arc definitely is paid off with that in mind of Joan of Arc uh, of Mina, you know, through the War of Souls. Um, Dark Disciple took a very seemingly different turn from that. Uh, of course, you know, she's moving from being a sort of champion for a god, you know, the one god, as it were, mm-hmm. um, into being, you know, realizing uh, you know her who she is. Um, I don't know why I tiptoe around it because it's it's been out for a while, so it shouldn't be a spoiler for anyone. <laughs> but I always feel like I'm uh, yeah. tiptoeing. It's weird. That's why I wrote that book. Is I didn't I didn't really feel we got to know her in War of Souls, and mm-hmm. and you know in Dark Disciple we got to know her more personally. Plus, I got to write about a border collie, which was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, the dog the tender was... herding border collie. <laughs> That's hilarious, <laughs> Gerard asking him, and even Jenna reaching out asking for a, a version of the pup or the dog. Um, someone was asking a question about does, you know, in the future when Tasselhoff is dead, does Tasselhoff and, um, um, oh, where's my note, Nightshade, are, do they know each other? Are they friends in the afterlife? <laughs> oh, God help us. <laughs> I feel sorry for Flint personally, but <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, okay. Do you do you think you have a little bit of time to talk uh, to answer some of the subscriber questions? Oh sure. Okay. Um, someone asked, "What is your favorite character, and why is it Tasselhoff Burfoot?" <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite character is Rachel. Yes. Uh, like but Tasselhoff is fun to write. Hmm. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I just have fun writing him. But thought, Raceland was the character I knew. Yeah, and that's the, the thing about it is, um I, I thought it was really interesting the way that Raceland was able to connect, even in War of Souls. Are you aware of the theory going around that in War of Souls, uh, when Raceland's involved, it's actually not Raceland; it's Takesis? No. <laughs> yeah, there's a theory out there about that, and I was I was stunned about it. Well, it's probably just as well I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all Raceland all day in War of Souls, <laughs> uh, connecting it. Um, okay, so there's uh, you, clearly you already a- answered this one with who is Mina based on. I mean, it's very Joan of Arc the, the whole way through. Um, and someone was asking any idea why it's um, Dragonlance has all but vanished for so long. And um, what would it take to gain all that lost momentum? Because, you know, Dragonlance was a slow, steady building train on the track for a, a very, very long time. And they just seemed to have dropped off. Do you have any insight into that? Well, Fifth Age kind of did it in. Um, the Fifth Age, when it came out, really divided the fan base. Yeah. And people were very passionate about it. They either hated it or they loved it. And when something like that happens, it can either be good or it can pretty much end in ruin. And the sales weren't there. And then again, like I said, TSR was in financial problems. Um, Wizards of the Coast came in and bought it. And um, it just, it, I think it had run its course. And Tracy yeah. and I wanted to move on. 
Mm-hmm. We had other worlds we wanted to write about. We wanted to do the guest Deathgate series. That was great. We had done Dark Sword. Uh, we were ready to, to leave and move on. Yeah. So it just came kind of to a mutual party. Um, I mean, that's a perfect tee up for uh, another question here. Any plans on revisiting Sularin from Rose of the Prophet or making a campaign setting book out of it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> Answered. Um, I mean, you're, I, I don't know if it's fair to ask you this when you're still in the middle of this trilogy, but is is this going to be the end as in the foreseeable future of you with uh, writing Dragonlance, or is it something that you would consider revisiting in the future again? Well, we don't know. I mean, yeah. I, Tracy and I have said this is the end of Dragonlance so many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we dare say it again. So. <laughs> um, is there ever any plans for um, the Draconians of Tyr like, that you would ever consider returning to? No. Okay. What about, I mean, you were licensing um, the IP of Dragonlance from Wizards of the Coast for um, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd edition, and you put out some of, in my opinion, the best Dragonlance products um, that arguably we've ever seen. Uh, I think, you know, the the amount of work put into those uh, from your team was just phenomenal, and the, the amount of information it distilled from everything that came before it but then built upon it was just fantastic. Do you think there's ever a chance of you wanting to walk that path again of licensing it? No, I'm retired. <laughs> okay. No, no. Right. I mean, my team did such a wonderful job and those books were really amazing. And in fact, I used a lot of those in my research. Uh, so I, I, even though they're third age and there's still so much in there reference material that people could use for the games that uh, that I'm really pleased with them and and they're I you know they're available on the second market secondary market oh yeah and sometimes I'm astonished at how much people want for them <laughs> yeah no I mean stuff gets really expensive and uh, I mean yeah. some of it is just random too I mean you know like uh-huh. one book out of a trilogy is infinitely more expensive than the other two you just strain stuff like mm-hmm. that um all right. Well, I, I really do appreciate your time uh, sitting here and talking uh, Dragonlance with me. Is there uh, any other projects that you're working on that you'd like to talk about or, or share with the audience? No, I really can't. Okay. I think that's so I, I I've got stuff in mind. You know, we're thinking of things all the time. Yeah. But um, right now we're just concentrating on Dragonlance. Well, I'm very, very happy for it. Uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased that... that you came back and, and you're putting this trilogy out. It's just, uh, it's nice to revisit old friends as we were speaking to earlier in the conversation. And this is just another way of doing that. And, and, and with, you know, new stories and new experiences in the same wonderful world that you, you helped create. So thank you very much oh. for doing that. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, is there, uh, where can people find you online uh, in order to, to look at? You know? Oh, I'm on Facebook. Um, Margaret Weiss on Facebook. And I'm on Twitter, uh, which is Weiss Marg, W-E-I-S-M-A-R-G. I'm there too. And um, so they can find me either of those places. And I have a website, MargaretWeiss.com. And you can order personalized books there. Yeah, I actually noticed that you were going to be selling signed, like autographed versions of Dragons of Deceit there as well, right? Uh, yeah, if it doesn't get too crazy. <laughs> <laughs> if there's not hundreds of thousands I mean, of requests. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I kind of draw the line at that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I would suggest anyone listening, if you want one, try to be the first, <laughs> not the yes, hundred. right. <laughs> the 300th. Um, thank you again so much for your time. Have a wonderful day. I wish the best for you. Okay. Thank you. We have come to the end of my interview with Margaret Weiss. She was incredibly gracious with her time, and I feel very fortunate to have been given the opportunity to speak with her. What do you think of the upcoming novel? Do you have a favorite novel she's written? And if you could have her write any Dragonlance novel of your choosing, what would it be about? Feel free to email me at info at or leave a comment below.
I'd like to once again invite you to consider becoming a member of this channel and remind you that you can always pick up Dragonlance Gaming materials using my affiliate link, all of which are in the description below. This channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga, and I hope you'll join me in the celebration. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, Slanjavar.